going through the Psalms and looking at how these people cry out to God, how they're uncut, they are uncensored in the Psalms with God. And we often feel that we got to tidy ourselves up, which literally goes against the gospel. Like we come dirty, jacked up because we can't fix ourselves. I'm Rush Witt, and you're listening to season two of Straight to the Heart, a podcast from New Growth Press. Each episode includes thought-provoking conversations with leading Christian writers and thinkers. We hear who they are, what they believe, and how they approach their work in ministry, and the moments and people who have changed their lives. In Straight to the Heart, we go beyond the books to connect with the remarkable people behind them. We're happy to be in our second season, so thank you for listening to, subscribing, and sharing Straight to the Heart with others. In this episode, I talk with pastor and author Jerome Gay Jr. about the challenge of ministry in our current culture, the important art of being winsome in conversation, and how pastors and Christians can productively engage others in discussion about difficult social topics. Jerome is also founder of The Urban Perspective, Thanks for joining us for season two. This is Straight to the Heart. So you're a busy guy. <laughs> yeah, a lot going on, man. A lot going on. But uh, God is faithful and he's keeping me. That's good. Well, t- tell me about these great things that you've got going on. You know, you've, you're, you're, you're pastoring. You are writing books. You are leading an organization, The Urban Perspective. And just tell me more about how all that's working together for you. You know, yeah. So just uh, my family is the the most important thing, right? Like, you know, I always tell guys I train, you know, the most important church is the one at your home address. Mm. And so for, for us, you know, my daughter started college. So she's a freshman at East Carolina University. My boy's in middle school. Uh, we celebrated 22 years of marriage in July. So oh, wow. I think that the thing that's kept me grounded in doing all those things is is scheduling around family time and making sure that the the family time isn't forfeited by the books and the preaching and speaking and all mm-hmm. those things. So I think that's been huge in keeping keeping me grounded and really my wife and I being on the same page of speaking engagements, being able to write books, being able to even, you know, do podcasts like this. So I think for, for me, it's just going back to that First Timothy 3, which talks about the qualifications of a pastor, one of the primary ones being your family, letting that be a, a source uh, that keeps me grand, rooted and grounded, which means sometimes I have to say no to things. Not not every opportunity is a, is a God-given one, even though it may be good. You know, I want to really look at just the health, the the connection, the closeness, the discipleship with within my family. And so that that focus of just making sure that familiar health is in place bleeds into these other things uh, that I have going on with the uh, the books, uh, my online YouTube channel, The Urban Perspective, which is more apologetic in nature, trying to equip the body of Christ in apologetics. And then, uh, you know, writing books um, from one on the Book of Ruth to the Christian history, to whitewashing Christianity, to my latest one, uh, African Heroes, uh, my first children's book. So all those things, again, kind of because even that book is based on my family. Right. Mm-hmm. So just coming back to that uh, Christ centered gospel foundation and how that springs forward into into the family, man. Well, you have a great perspective on on that and the use of use of time, which I think is really important. You know, I, I really admire people that can uh, that can do a lot with their time, but keep things in balance. And I know that's really hard. Um, at the same time, there's a there's a ton of time in a week. There's really a lot of time if we count it up and and prioritize it. And it's a it's an encouragement to me to hear you talk about your family and and ministry and how you're keeping all of that straight. Uh, tell me, tell me more about the urban perspective, because I don't know about this. Yeah. So that's a a YouTube channel I started several years ago, really because one, one of, one of the things I used to wrestle with prior to becoming a Christian was that the Christians I encountered didn't answer questions. Mm -hmm. Um, they would usually have a, a Christian cliche or they would just say, don't question God. And I used to always wrestle with that. I was like, well, you you just told me he knows everything. He's Mm -hmm. omniscient. Um, so why shouldn't I question the one who literally knows everything according to what you're saying about him? Mm. 
Right. And so that that just never made sense to me that you're telling me not to question the person who knows everything as I'm wrestling with, should I trust him or not with my soul? And so uh, as I became a Christian, when I became a Christian, I, I wanted to be one, not who knows everything because people aren't saved by knowledge, right? However, we should give a reason for the hope that lies within us, 1 Peter 3.15. Hmm. And so I wanted to create a YouTube channel that would dig into some of these objections to Christianity, things that people may be wrestling with concerning Christianity, uh, misconceptions about Christian history. So many people keep saying uh, Christianity was cre- created at the Council of Nicaea. Like, no, no, it wasn't. You know, like this, that's not historically, you know, mm-hmm. even though I know this may not convert you, but that's historically inaccurate. And so wanting Christians to be equipped in knowing what they believe and why we believe it, because we should not be followers with blind faith because Paul, um, Peter, I'm sorry, writes faith and reason can coexist. And because faith and reason can coexist, Christians should be critical thinkers. We should critically look at our text. We should ask questions of the text. And these things won't lead us to deconstruction. They will lead us to a more firmness of our faith. And so that's the heart of that. Um, You know, youtube.com slash the urban perspective is where people can see some of the content uh, a lot of discussions, interviewing people, or some of them just me solo addressing a particular topic. You know, it seems to me that, uh, you know, because of the fall, there have always been race issues. But the, the most recent season in our society seems in certain ways to have brought a lot of that to the forefront or to the right. minds and hearts of people. And right. so I wonder, even in the last few years, uh, as these things have happened, uh, what has been your perspective uh, or your point of view on on the developments, the challenges, and what have you seen as being the most important aspects of this issue to try to wrangle with so that we can keep the gospel central and uh, and bring it to bear upon these really serious, personal, grievous issues in our society? Yeah, I think first is we we need to admit some of the hermeneutical errors that have been made in antiquity by people who called themselves Christians. Mm. Like we we have to be able to admit that that you know Whitfield, you know we 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 call him great for his homiletics, but he owned slaves, and we we can't make excuses for things like that. You know he did not leave you know anything in his will to his slaves when people try to try to rosy it up. You know what I mean? You know, we look at Jonathan Edwards, we, we have to look at these things and say, hey, there, there are people that we've called heroes mm-hmm. um, who, who may have had good orthodoxy, um, but they didn't quite have good orthopraxy in terms mm-hmm. of how they treated people who did not look like them. And then going, taking that to the scriptures where First John, the apostle John writes, hey, you cannot say you love God who you can't see if you don't love your neighbor who you can see in First John 4. So having that biblical foundation. But then while we're pressing into that, acknowledging the ills of history and making sure that scripture is our foundation, it, we also need to come back and say that race is a feature of who we are, but it was never intended to be the foundation. Right. So race is a feature, not our foundation. Christ is our foundation. That doesn't mean I'm ashamed to be a black man or I won't use that label, but I know who the source of my identity is. Uh, and so it's important that we address these things, but then come back and make sure we combat those things in the past that need to be combated or these ideals in the present that need to be combated. But we also need to be compellingly compassionate about the concerns of those who are saying, like, I'm seeing this mistreatment, I'm experiencing this, and make sure we're not just automatically dismissing them as liberal lefters without even knowing them, without knowing their story, without actually hearing their position. It's important that we, you know, we actually show that grace and compassion. He was full of grace and truth, and we need to make sure that we exhibit that as well in conversations like this. Uh, you know, it seems like as we talk about your your life and ministry and the things that God is is doing and the ways that He's using you, that you know you're really focused on you know leadership development, teaching as a pastor, as an author, collaboration with other people to for, for ministry and for the good of the gospel. And really, I I think as I think about that list, that there's a common thread there of really about communication. A lot of what we've been talking about so far is is how we communicate with other people and in particular with those who have who have differing viewpoints. And you've right. used the word winsome 
which is a word that I really like, actually probably the most prominent influence in my life. Uh, with respect to that word in particular is probably David Pallison, biblical counseling leader and a huge, huge influence in the biblical counseling movement. And so I'm, I'm curious just to talk a little more with you about that word, winsome. As you think about communication, teaching, uh, developing leaders, what is it about being winsome that is valuable to you? And why is that, you know, one of those key, you know, high dollar words for you? Yeah, I think when I when I hear that word, you know, it, like everything, there's nuance with it. Some hear, hear winsome and they hear compromise. Mm. Um, I hear winsome and I think engagement um, with truth. So for us, we we wanted to engage like like literally now I'm we're walking through Jude, the book of Jude. It's a lot of stuff in those 25 verses, you know, one being Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. So mm -hmm. I have to address sexuality. Um, and I believe in what the Bible says, a biblical sexual ethic of marriage being between a man and a woman. I believe what scripture says. Um, I don't back down from that. But I also believe that we shouldn't be you know, using derogatory terms, right? So, so winsome is this idea of holding the truth, but still letting them know that grace is available. That's the beauty of First Corinthians six, where he's saying, you know, some idolaters, homosexuals, and such were some of you. Well, for them to be that, for that to be in that past, that means that they had to be engaged, that they were one to Christ uh, by God drawing them to to Himself, most likely through a human agent. And so, we want to be those human agents that. God uses to draw people to himself, to depopulate hell for his glory. And the only way we can do that um, is being led by the spirit, but we don't need to offend for the wrong reasons. I, I do agree that the gospel is offensive because not mm -hmm. everyone believes it, but we want to make sure that the gospel is offending, not us being spirit, spiritual jerks <laughs> and not, not, not showing I love, agree. not, not being winsome, yeah. not being loving. So let's hold the truth. Like, so, Perfect time for you to ask me this, Rush, is like I'm literally having to go before people and say, hey, some of you are going to disagree with this, but we agree with what the scripture says, but I want to do it in a winsome and a loving way. Yeah. One of the principles that comes to mind as we have this conversation, which actually came into clear review for me uh, personally and as a pastor through the recent struggles that all of us have faced because of uh, major issues that have to be addressed, differences between people, has really mm -hmm. been the difference between a kind of mission field mentality and a battlefield mentality. Because right. as we led our church in particular, through uh, the you know the last few pretty rough years because there was obviously the pandemic it was mixed with political issues it was mixed with yep. big social issues yep. that one of the things we really struggled to um, keep our hearts on was just the way that we were going to interact with other people and what what tends to happen I think for me and probably for a lot of Christians is we tend to get into this debate mode I'm just going to try to show you all the facts so that you'll come to my side but uh, rather than just going at the facts of the issue to try to win a debate about something there is an opportunity because of the gospel to use that difference as an entry gate into the life and right. experience of that person. And I know that I need help with that. And lots of people that I know are wrestling and need help. And so what have you seen in that way of personal interaction and, you know, mission over battle, um, ministry over debate in your own interactions with people as a pastor or as a Christian in your community? How have you seen that play out? Yeah, I want to I want to <clears throat> always use fil uh, scripture as my filter, right? So it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. So I want to I want to know like my goal isn't to beat the person. My goal is to war in the spirit by being led by the spirit. And so he's going to lead me into all truth. And so this person is not going to be won over by my intellect or my eloquence, or even if I prove them wrong. Um, they, they, I, in that moment, I want to be a tangible display of the gospel. So my tone, my demeanor, and of mm. course, you know, my, my argument, so to speak, does matter, but I can at the expense of those other things. 
So sometimes there's a wrong way to be right. And, and I want to recognize that I, I can be guilty of that, that I can be guilty of saying the right thing the wrong way. <clears throat> and so because I'm aware of that, I want to pay attention to those things that that I, I don't need to come across as arrogant or condescending or because I have a degree in this and they don't. Um, not trying to make them look or feel stupid on my end. I can't control how they feel um, because we are in a culture now where it's like, unless you affirm me, you know, you could be called a bigot no matter what tone you use, mm. you know, in today's culture. But I'm, I'm, I am still responsible for how I present it. And I, I want to present it, you know, in a loving way. And so that's, that's why I'm looking at it where I want it, 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 it's, it's really both. It's a mission battlefield, but, the, the battle isn't for us to win an argument. The, mm. the battle is God is saving souls. And so that's what we need to, we need to be willing to adjust our tone or whatever. It is. I mean, if, if Paul is willing to give up meat in first Corinthians eight, if Paul is willing to become all things to all men so that they may share in the gospel, that's the point that they would share in the gospel. Then we need to have that same posture, uh, being willing to give up things for the sake of the engagement of a soul. At New Growth Press, we love to produce children's books which are beautiful, engaging, and biblical, and also helpful in teaching children important truths of our faith. African Heroes, Discovering Our Christian Heritage, shows children how God has used all races and ethnicities in His plan of redemption by celebrating and highlighting the contributions of African theologians and martyrs. Author Jerome Gay introduces children to the stories of 11 amazing African leaders, including Augustine, Athanasius, Tertullian, and more. African Heroes presents these figures on a level children can understand with diverse imagery and colorful illustrations. This book is written for children ages four to seven to show the African roots of the early church. Visit newgrowthpress.com to learn more. You know, as we think about, in particular, some of those big issues, like like racial issues in our country or in the world, and uh, other issues of justice, disagreement, uh, kind of the clash of worldviews, it seems like one of the things that may hold a lot of Christians back, especially in this charged moment where mm-hmm. we, we hear a lot about, you know, what's coined as cancel culture, it sort of surrounds the conversation or the, the ministry opportunity with this danger or the sense of danger and fear. And I, I think it, that probably holds a lot of us back from knowing how to get involved, because if I feel like I don't know the right thing to say, and I say the wrong thing, the stakes are really high because I, I'm watching the news. I'm, I'm interacting with people and I'm seeing the way mistakes are becoming costlier and costlier as we move on. So I wonder just from your experience, your wisdom, your writing, um, you know, what can individuals who may feel that fear, what, what are some ways that individuals can be active in this in the most helpful ways? We we have to be willing to get out of our echo chambers mm. and we, we have to get out of the echo chamber and be willing to be a minority and to be misunderstood and mislabeled. And that's that's part of, you know, Paul's life. Right. You know, if you look at <laughs> you, he's a Jew called the Gentile. So he's like, hey, you're going to be my instrument to people who are completely culturally dif- different from you. Right. Culturally, socially, economically. And yeah, that's where I want you to go. And so when we uh, when we assess our calling, we and we're we're trying to be um, a repairer of the bridge, then we just have to live with the tension that some people will make untrue assumptions about us, but we're still willing to not leave the room or the conversation. And that's that's what takes a move of the Holy Spirit, man, because that's that's what I've seen is people leave, like when when they're not affirmed or they're not agreed with, or if they're mislabeled. And they they could legitimately like, yo, that's not you. You were called a racist wrongly. Um, When you were literally trying to seek knowledge and they labeled your ignorance as racism, which is why in my book, my book, The Whitewashing of Christianity, I intentionally did a subtitle because I know some people are going to hear that and assume white bashing. That's the furthest thing from the truth. So the subtitle is a hidden past, a hurtful present, but a hopeful future. 
So I want to use that, that H alliteration to say, hey, I'm going somewhere, but we got to deal with this ugliness. And in that, I did a racial spectrum. And I said, there's racial ignorance, which is when we don't know, because some of our experiences may have been primarily homogenous. So there's racial ignorance. Then there's racial indifference. So if racial ignorance is don't know, racial indifference is don't care. It's like uh, mm-hmm. e- either either one can happen. Then there's a racial insensitivity. Uh, mm-hmm. This is when you're entertaining things about other groups that are you know that are harmful that you probably need to turn from. Then there's racism. So we can go from racial racial ignorance, racial indifference, racial insensitivity, then racism. We now can kind of see where we are on that spectrum, as opposed to immediately calling everything racist when that may not be the case. Yeah, for for pastors also and other leaders, you know, church leaders or leading voices and those who have, you know, maybe particular or disproportionate influence in their churches. Um, thinking about your church and other churches that have done well to engage these difficult topics, what do you see as maybe the top one or two moves that they have made to strengthen their congregation in their preparation to bring the gospel into really challenging moments and to bring truth in winsome ways, what would you say are some of those pieces of advice you would give to pastors like you? I'm a pastor as well. So pastors like me, what would you say to me as a fellow pastor that I could be thinking about, praying about, focusing on in my church? Yeah. One of the things I I had to do is just, you know, listen to people I disagree with, Um, not, um, not to affirm, especially if it's false doctrine, but at least to know, because some of these YouTube people with millions of views and or subscribers, my people are listening to some of these people. Mm-hmm. And so as much as their view may be, it makes no sense to me, right? Like, I'm like, how, how, you know, to someone is hitting them. So I need to, now, of course, we can't listen to everything, but I'm the, the primary kind of patterns I'm seeing or things that I'm seeing my people like or reshare that are harmful, I need to be aware of those as a shepherd. Because I'm trying to, my, my, my job is to lead, feed, know, care, protect as an elder, um, one, of, one of six at, at my church. Um, so I want to know those things. But then, he, he, you know, the, the other thing in that is also really encourage my people to, uh, and I, 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 so I created a position. Um, one of our pastors is, is pastor of health and strategy. And so his entire job is, you know, he's found organizations so that all of our team can get counseling, um, that we can have these things to process our own trauma. And then how can we make certain things available for the church? Because this is an aspect of a, a healthy church that we've ignored, um, is understanding that. Um, there's a book called The The Other Half of the Church, where there's this neuro neurological theologian who, who dug into this, just the aspect hmm. of how God has created our brains that often gets ignored in discipleship and spiritual formation. And so knowing that we want to look even into that, like part of this, part of the reason we can't get together is because you don't know how to handle conflict because you have so much trauma that you haven't processed and you're unwilling to get, get counsel. So even though it doesn't seem like it's connected to the race conversation, it is because when disagreement comes up and the person is of a different race, you immediately castigate them as racist or harmful because Mm -hmm. you don't know how to be disagreed with because you never got counseling on how to handle conflict. So it's like when you learn like, oh, okay, it's a lot deeper than we're just looking at the response. We're not dealing with the root. And so really having a, a community of counseling. Uh, which I'm really proud of our church where like we we just had an event on well, that, that was called traumatic residue where we brought in a counselor to talk so people can begin to learn like there are certain things that have impacted me and now they're affecting my friendships, my parenting, my marriage. They're impacting all of these things because I have not addressed it. And so uh, and then lastly, doing series on it. You know, we've I've done I did a series called Safe Space. You know, I did a series on these things, really um, going through the Psalms and looking at how these people cry out to God, how they're uncut. They are uncensored in the Psalms with God. And we often feel that we got to tidy ourselves up, which literally goes against the gospel. Like we come dirty, jacked up because we can't fix ourselves. And so wanting people to have that freedom. So having that position, a culture of counseling 
and then listening to people you disagree with. Hmm. We all know that conversations about race and ethnicity can be uncomfortable. So I want you to know about the mini book, Talking to Your Children About Race, a biblical framework for honest conversations by Jerome Gay Jr. Often parents don't know what to say or how to say it. It might seem easier to duck a hard, confusing subject, but your children are already learning about race from the world around them. Pastor Jerome Gay Jr. equips parents for conversations about race, helping you take an active role in ensuring that your children are given a biblically rooted and gospel saturated view of race and ethnicity. You can learn tips for discussing issues of injustice and biblical reconciliation, as well as proactively engaging and learning from others from different ethnic backgrounds. By not shying away from this topic, we can be equipping our own children as kingdom citizens who reflect Jesus to a polarized world. Visit newgrowthpress.com to learn more about talking to your children about race by Jerome Gay Jr. I appreciate really that, uh, especially everything you're saying, but especially uh, the part about listening to those that we disagree with, because as you said, it's so easy to be caught in this echo chamber where all you hear is your own voice or your own, you know, uh, group kind of speaking back to you, the things that you already believe. And so, you know, I really appreciate that. A lot of our listeners obviously are readers. And so I have a question that I think is, uh, is helpful and interesting for you. And it's, uh, it may be a little bit of a longer one, but in terms of books that you have found helpful, I wonder uh, around these difficult topics, what are two books that come to mind that you were really helped by because they agreed with you and they helped develop your biblical viewpoint. And what are two books that were written by people that disagreed with you that were most helpful to you to glean from them the other side so that you could understand how, how do these conversations need to be uh, crafted to be most productive and helpful and understanding and charitable? So specifically when we're talking about more like race, culture, and history, so two books that I agree with, um, it, the f- first one would be Urban Apologetics, uh, where I contributed to the book, but Dr. Eric Mason was the general editor because it's dealing with these different topics. And so there are several volumes of that. So I would say each of those volumes, people should get those because it's, it's, it's equipping us on how to engage these. The second book would be A Burning House by Brandon Washington. Um, where he's 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 talking about evangelicalism and digging into the history of how how we got to this point, and so those those are two two books I would definitely um, suggest. So Urban Apologetics, Dr. Eric Mason, A Burning House by Brandon Washington, um, books that where I, I may kind of probably disagree with a lot of their assessment, but it's still equipping. One is called Woke Racism by John McCorder. Um, but he was a he was a columnist and but he's more of a conservative African American and he's kind of digging into these things. And so again, there's pieces I agree with and I, I disagree with. Black Out by Candace Owens, who's definitely uh <laughs> you know, a hot, hot, uh hot button topic. Um so yeah, re- reading her where I said like, hey, I, I, and there there are some aspects I do agree with, um, but there's a lot I disagree with in terms of her approach and even some of her conclusions and how they view certain aspects of history uh, that that I may see as incomplete. Uh, so those those are two. If I'm restricted to two and two, I would say those. I've asked you a lot of hard questions, difficult, heavy questions. So here's a softball uh, as maybe a last question today, which I think will be interesting to hear what you say. If you inherited, uh, let's say, ten million dollars tomorrow. Wow. Okay. What are you going to do with it? And it does not have to be spiritual, <laughs> church related. It's it's honest. It's an honest question. What would you do with ten million dollars tomorrow? Yeah. So, I, well, this this is literally just what I would do. All right. Let me first set aside some for God's mission. That's just how I how we operate. Um, let's pay off our house, no debt. Let's let's have more. Um, Because I I want to think about, even though I wouldn't be here in this scenario, but I I think about my impact for my family when I'm gone. So what what am I leaving? Um, Then I can get to more personal stuff, you know, handle kind of God's kingdom 
our, you know, no debt for us, our kids. Um, and then thinking through, um, you know, if, if I could have put more into creating nice online content, I would, I would build up a, a nice state of the art studio, um, for that, for that, for, for the YouTube channel and then empowering other solid Orthodox Christian YouTubers and stuff, because people aren't reading. I mean, that's just the truth. You know, I'm, I'm, we're going to keep writing, but generally speaking, people want those video sound bites. Mm. So we need to have good content out there that's going to combat a lot of the false stuff that's getting millions of views. Because the truth is, the, the lie gets more clicks than the truth. Mm. But we still need to keep putting truth out there. So those are some some of the things I would do. Obviously, vacations and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm. I want to have fun with it. I'm going to be honest. With you. I'm going to be real with you. I'm, I'm going to have some fun. <laughs> we going to, we have some trips and stuff. But um, just being 44 and having a family, like just my first thought is let, let's make sure these things are taken care of. Now let's have some fun with the rest. That's smart. Yeah. And I don't think either of us have to worry about this problem. But I know, right? Fun to, <laughs> it's fun to talk about. Right, it's right. Fun to think about. I like your ideas. They're They're similar to mine. Well, I've really enjoyed, Jerome, spending this time with you today. Yeah, same here. I appreciate it. I enjoy learning from people who have thought about key important topics more than I have, and it just helps me, and it helps the people who are listening. Thanks for having me, man. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. You've been listening to Straight to the Heart, a podcast from New Growth Press. Our next episode releases next week, and I look forward to seeing you there.